Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Specifying Practice Group webinar. Our topic for today is a continuation of last month's discussion, reviewing sample specifications. Our thought leaders are David Stutzman and Lewis Metcalf. David is a registered architect, certified construction specifier, and founding principal of Conspectus, a specifications and quality assurance consultant firm. Lewis is an architect and certified construction specifier. He's a senior quality manager for Gresham Smith & Partners, a national architecture, engineering, interiors, and planning firm. This is Lewis Medcalf coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, my cohort, uh, David Stutzman, the famous road warrior, is coming from where are you this, today, David? I'm in lovely downtown Teaneck, New Jersey, at the Marriott. Very good. We're attending the AIA trade show. Good. Well, today we are continuing our discussion of uh, kind of a page format discussion. And uh, last week we talked about uh, the project and issuing information. And we showed examples where people put information in the header only, footer only, and some and some examples where information was distributed between the the header and the footer. And uh, we had a lot of participation, which Dave and I enjoyed uh, considerably. A lot of questions and comments, suggestions, ideas, and uh, we hope that uh, this. Today's presentation will also spark a similar amount of interaction because ultimately that's what Dave and I really want is uh, rather than us, you know, putting, doing too much in the way of lecturing, we really want this to be kind of a virtual round table for uh, trading ideas and concepts, what works, what doesn't work, and, and uh, encouragement. And uh, so we want you to feel free to participate at, at any time. So t today we're going to pick up, uh, as I say, where we broke off. And uh, right now the, the next section, the next few examples I'm going to show relate to draft versus final. And um, we have a couple of polling questions. And uh, Rob, would you go ahead and um, polling question uh, three, do you use a separate template for draft specs, that one? Would you please put that up? <coughs> uh, this is something that I'd, I've used a separate template for draft specs for many years. And uh, uh, then have a macro that converts the specs section to the final version uh, with a, a single keystroke when I do the final editing after the review by the project architect. But I don't, I'm not sure how wide that is. Go ahead, David. Why are you doing, I was going to say, why are you doing that, Lewis? I, because if I were to hand something to some of our clients as a draft that looked different than how they would expect it to be as a final, uh, that they would probably be upset. <laughs> well, my, uh, I'll tell you what, why don't we put off just a little bit until I actually show you what it looks like. Um, okay, our, is our poll closed? What's, what's the response? It is. Overwhelming. Okay. I must be right, Lewis. There's, apparently, there's only one other person that does it besides myself. I wonder who that is. <clears throat> well, anyway, uh, one of the ways, of course, that we can indicate a draft spec so that it, you know, the problem is, especially in the old days of paper where we were assembling these large stacks of paper, that we don't want to let something escape from the office that really wasn't ready to go. And so, um, we have an example here from uh, from our friend from Mitch Miller. That's right, from Mitch Miller, and where he uses a watermark in the background that says "draft" on it. So that's that's one way of of doing that. And then uh, let me 
then the method that I've used is this is what my draft sections use. Now, of course, uh, it differs from um, David's experience because my uh, work was always in-house. And so what I would do is I would circulate these drafts that look like this and let the PA mark them up and comment and, and whatever. And you can see I even have a little circulation box there in case more than one person wanted to, to look at the specs. And that often happened at my pre this is from my previous employer. And uh, then with uh, a macro and two keystrokes, I would convert to the, uh, the template that had the final format that looks like this. And again, the idea was just to make a, a very dramatic difference so that the wrong version didn't get included. Um, there's an, a minor advantage that you'll notice in my draft form. I have a little extra white space in the right column or the right margin to allow people to write notes on. Uh, but that was the, the basic concept. Anyway, it's just uh, another approach that I thought some folks might be example might be interested in. Just and, curious, Lewis, when you're circulating yes. these, when you're circulating these for the draft for comments, yes. is that something that you're doing on a paper version? It was in those days. Now, of course, today we would probably be doing that electronically, and and maybe the difference in the and the appearance wouldn't be that, that big a deal, but yeah, in the, we're talking about uh, four or five years ago when I was working at my previous firm and was circulating the, the paper for comments. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have a comment here from Alan. All right. Well, already. Already, you're on a roll. We may not make it through this session. Okay. <laughs> it says. Uh, when I submitted a draft to a client for review, I leave it with all the track changes so when they are reviewing it, they can see what I've deleted and can tell me to leave it in if necessary. The only problem with that is it makes a very, very long section, especially if you're using master spec that has some 50 and 60 page sections. But that's certainly uh, a good approach because otherwise, if you're a specifications consultant, because uh, then that your client can see very quickly if there was something that you've uh, taken out that they really want back in. Uh, what's the? Why don't you read these for me, David? Okay. Yeah. One more here from uh, Joel Nini. Uh -huh. uh, it says that he had to leave early last time, so he missed being able to comment. But for the page layout headers and footers, particularly. I prefer to have the section number, page number appear in both and at the upper right and lower left. That way for double side printing, the section number and page number can be seen in the printed page. Um, and I, I had one question for you Yes. on the draft that um, Mitch Miller submitted. Do you know if that was for alternating headers and, f and footers? Uh, let me check and see. Because we ran into just just a recent development. If you're trying to use alternating headers and footers and using the dra the watermarks, sometimes they only appear on the odd number pages. Oh, because well, this it's associated with the header. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Well, he has it. This I'm showing. This is page two, and you can see that it it printed on page two as well as as right. page but one. Right, but it's not. But it's not alternating. No. Header footers. No. I hadn't run into that, so that's an interesting situation. Okay, we. Then the next example I thought we might look at is how do we track revisions. Um, we're all doing more and more projects with multiple work packages in which a, a given specification section may be issued uh, 
two or three or even four times with revised information. And here's an example that uh, uh, Ms. Baker sent in just uh, just recently uh, that shows you know kind of a typical method of if you turn on the track changes feature you get strike through for deleted text and um, underlining for uh, in inserted text and then she actually marks the revisions in there now that's not something I've done in the past normally um, but one thing I've done I forgot to include an example is to put a revision table at the end of the spec section just like you have on the drawings so that you can see um, the history of how a given how many times a given section was uh, issued and then when you make the revision the second revision you can accept all the changes uh, and then automatically and start over with a clean copy and then just indicate the most recent changes. Now one of my correspondents uh, said that she preferred to make those changes um, by hand and that's certainly an approach to do but I like the automatic features on the track changes. I see we have some more uh, comments that have come in. Right, and it's both of them are talking about the watermark in the header and footer and saying that they can be placed on each page even with alternating headers and footers. And that's true. You just need to be aware because the watermarks are associated with the header uh, that if you have alternating headers, you may have to place it twice. So those comments coming from Deborah Swift and John uh, Schleigett. Schle oh, okay. I'm sorry, Schleigetter. Schleigetter. Okay, um, and then you probably need to put your hand over the microphone for when we're in between times, kind of cut down on some of the background distraction for Lee. So that's, uh, that's the revision tracking. Now the next section we thought we'd talk a little bit about text density and the question of one column or two. And our good friend Sheldon Wolf. Uh, sent us an example of a two-column layout with the uh, like magazines. The advantage of this is if you're reading dense text, uh, it cuts down the number of words per line so that your eye movement can grab a whole line without having to make two movements per line for reading. And uh, I've experimented with this. I actually haven't issued any specs with two columns. Have you done that, David? I, I have not issued anything with two columns and my uh, concern about using two column text is that it works well for printed copy but electronically where you're scrolling, if you have to constantly be scrolling to read multiple columns on the same page, I think that's a problem. And that is that is very true, and we're going to talk a little bit more about about uh, paper versus electronic viewing uh, a little later in the presentation. And but that's something certainly to keep in mind. Um, could we go ahead with the next polling question, Rob? Oh, I see. We skip skip one. Go ahead and put the the draft the question about the draft watermax watermarks. On. And then if we... This looks like an overwhelming no, too, Lewis. Yeah. So apparently that's maybe that's a non-issue for most firms, and that's fine. It's, you know, it's whatever works for you and your, uh, your practice. Okay. Well, Rob, will you go ahead and put the next polling question on about the two-column format or as soon as that closes? Okay. And we have a comment from Sheldon Wolf about oh, the yes. watermark, and he's saying he doesn't use the watermark, uh, but he does show a date and it 
indicates it a draft in the footer. Um, if you notice my example, use that too. And that's uh, certainly another way to, to do that and to try to control. Maybe not quite as dramatic, but again, it's what works for you and your firm. So uh, the question is... And we're, we're uh, on a roll. So we're on a roll with these polls. Overwhelming majority or no? Okay. Well, that doesn't surprise me. Um, and again, as we move into preparing documents that people are going to be viewing on tablet computers and smartphones at the job site, um, we are going to have to rethink page format. And uh, so that makes perfect sense. But as I say, this was such a, an excellent example of the concept uh, that I thought I would show it. And here's another example. Uh, this one from Ms. Nelson. Um, and again, it's very readable, uh, certainly. The one thing that we have going for us in specifications is that usually the contractor doesn't sit down or other readers and read all the way straight through. So we don't have a lot of, of lengthy paragraphs unless you use master format. And uh, so really what the contractor is looking for is what do I do about warranties? What do I do about maintenance? What do I do for submittals? Look for those things and then hit those uh, uh, brief paragraphs, one and two sentence paragraphs are ideal for that sort of thing. And Sheldon comments that uh, two columns don't work for master spec and other verbose specs. And he's absolutely right. Okay. And Lewis, I'm surprised yes. we haven't had any comments on the sections that you're showing that are displaying all of the non-printing characters. Um, oh, yes. Let's see. Let's go back. And Rob, do you have that um, polling, that poll question up? Was that about using the uh, official fonts? That's the one about uh, the hidden characters. <clears throat> As you can see in these examples, see the little arrow shows that that's uh, a tab. And you can see the paragraph markers at the ends of the paragraphs. And if you look very closely, it's probably too small on your screens. There's actually a little dot that shows whether there's one space or two spaces in between words and between sentences. And I like that. I've used it all the time. But I know some of the folks that I work with here at the office, that absolutely drives them wild. And they really hate it. So we're we're uh, getting the responses in, and they're evening out. That's interesting. Ah, uh, but uh, I thought we I thought we were going to have a winner here, Lewis, for the the yes essential. But yeah. no, looks like nope. it's only sometimes is the favorite. Okay. Well, that's a, again. It's you know what what works for you, but uh, I wouldn't <laughs> think of doing it without it. Um, Wayne sent in a comment about the uh, watermarks. That I think is interesting, uh, which I wasn't aware of. He says that adding watermarks to PDFs grossly enlarges the PDF file, and so large that they can go beyond the size limits placed for email attachments. So that's something to look out for. I hadn't hadn't thought about that, and that's would certainly uh, uh, favor putting a, a draft mark just in the footer or with normal or bold text or something. Okay. Our next discussion has to do with white space, and uh, David was going to talk to us a little bit about the importance of having white space. And here's a kind of a typical example. 
that's uh, pretty orthodox. Right. And, well, yeah, and it is important, I think, because if you're trying to actually read the document and comprehend it quickly. The, the nicest part about this example is that, first of all, it's not justified text. So your eyes can follow the paragraph, you can follow the line really easily, and being able to locate text on the page because of all the white space in this example is actually easier. And it's easier to recognize the outline structure. Now this one is showing unlike master spec that would put uh, extra white space between changes of paragraph levels, I, I prefer to see the paragraph levels tight when you get down to the lower levels because I try not to um, get too deep in the outline structure. So I like to have the, the text a little bit tighter. This, this one that Lewis is showing now is more the master spec standard where it, increases the white space between changes in the levels. But let's, you what, know, do you, you have what do to, you think of that? I don't like it myself. and I have a, a macro to get rid of. Well, actually, you don't need a macro. You just select the whole. Uh, you do control A to select all the text in, a, in, the, um, in the document, and then control Q, and it gets rid of any idiosyncratic individualized formatting on a paragraph and gets rid of it. But I like a little bit of paragraph, a little space between not exactly single lines. So what I do is put four points ahead of subparagraphs. Here's another example. This is very dense text, where we're not even having two spaces between paragraphs. and. Uh, also, a lot of words per line, and um, right. I I agree with you on this one, Lewis. I think it's dense enough that it makes it really difficult to read. And back to the point about master spec, uh, with that paragraph spacing between level changes, yes. they do that manually through a macro in yes. Word 2007 and Word 2010 you can actually set that as part of the style so you no longer have to rely on oh, that's a manual setting. Yeah, because if, if I was writing a new, a new paragraph with some sub-paragraphs, then I'd have to try to match it, and it just I didn't like that. Well, and even better, if you set it in 2007 and 10, 2003 honors the setting but you cannot make the setting in 2003. Oh, interesting. I suspect that that's also in their um, Masterworks software, but I'm uh, frankly, I don't use it, so I don't know that much about it. Here's another example. This is um, a kind of a typical uh, government spec. This is a, from a Veterans Administration project that was uh, sent in, and um, here you have a page, uh, you have a line and a half spacing, and everything is a line and a half, rather than uh, having differences between extra space ahead of articles and, and uh, two line spaces between full paragraphs. And here, our right. last and I think on the Okay, I'm sorry, Lewis, but on that right. VA spec, yeah. I was actually going to say that I think I think it makes each one of those lines look almost like a paragraph because you're because of the white space. Yeah, it's, and it makes you want to be looking for additional paragraph numbering. I think I find it difficult to read myself, um, you know, and that's your tax dollars at work, but uh, we'll look at, we have some more examples later on of a, a specs intact uh, project that has very similar stuff. But yes, I find it very difficult to read. It's it's like, I don't know if you ever had to deal with uh, legal documents that are, every line is double spaced and that just drives me crazy to try to read those things. All right, let's see. Um, and so I want to go back to 
uh, Dave Lorenzini's example. Well, I have to give Dave so. We really have to give him some credit for uh, a, a dramatic appearance. Man, we got we have color. We have some very dramatic changes in uh, font size and and shape, and lots of white space. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, paragraph line paragraphs that result in short lines, so your eye can scan very quickly ac across to the end of the line and go back to the one without having to make two. Uh, movements for a given line, and um, that's a very clean, handsome-looking uh, spec page. Well, the other thing that's nice about this is the the article titles being pulled out away from the outline structure enough that they're really recognizable. Yeah, that's something that I try to accomplish by using a, a different font, by using a sans serif. Uh, this is Arial Bold font, and then just Times Roman for the actual uh, normal stuff. And we'll talk a little bit about that in our, our next uh, area of discussion, having to do with font size and style. And so it's time for our next polling question, number six. Does your firm require specs to use the same official font used for firm correspondence and other documents, your brand font. So if you will put that Good up. Good question. And let's ask Dave Lorenzini how he manages to get the other engineering consultants on the project to match that format. Dave, if you're out there, please uh, let's get a comment in and explain how you do that. Yeah, we'll we'll be talking about consultant specs here, sort of towards the end. But uh, please uh, get ready to do that. Um, next, I want to talk about uh, font size and style. And okay, so okay, uh, the the poll there. Did you go over the poll? Uh, no, no. Go right ahead, David. Okay, well, it looks like an overwhelming majority. Again, we like no today. It must be the specifier in us all kicking in. Um, but it's interesting because my clients are very much in tune with actually having every spec in the sec in the project manual looking identical. Font, layout, indents, outline structure. Uh, so I'm sort of surprised at this response. Well, on the other hand, actually, the question, David, was, you know, if your firm uses um, a special uh, uh, font for its official correspondence that may not be available, that's not one of the window standard fonts that everybody has, then that makes it difficult to get everybody to use the same font. Uh, and that was my question is... Uh, do you want to have firms that are using a, a specific font because like Optima, for example, that's uh, kind of gone out of fashion, but at one time all the AIA documents were printed in Optima and one of the firms I worked for used Optima for its official um, correspondence, but they never put any restrictions on what font I should use for the specs, and that was just the curiosity. But we do have a few people that uh, apparently their branding is strong enough that they, uh, about 27% said that they uh, do use the same font that they use for official uh, correspondence uses. Let's see. I think we need to catch up with some of our comments, David. you want to... And actually, I think I've lost track of where, <laughs> where we stopped. Okay, here's uh, I asked Dave Lorenzini to chime in, and he says that he sends uh, consultants a template to use, and after many years, they are more comfortable using it. So I suppose that's how he's getting all of the consultants on board to have all the specs look alike. We also had a comment on David's example that uh, a long project manual due to the spacing of text. And yeah, you might have to, 
it probably does add a page or two to most spec sections. Uh, but again, as we move into electronic versions, that becomes a non-issue. If you're reading it on the, if you're just reading it on the tablet, it's not a big deal, and we may actually get to the point where um, uh, there are only one or two signed copies for official purposes. As a matter of fact, I have a very funny story. I hope I didn't tell it last time, you know, us how us old guys repeat ourselves. But years ago when I was up in Ohio in Cincinnati working, <clears throat> the state of Ohio projects required the specs to be printed on uh, 11 by 14, uh, 8 and a half by 14 paper, the so called legal size. And the only way to bind those things is with those two hole ACO. Uh, binders that are made out of old coffee cans that are not very strong at the top of of the page. You can't bind them on the side, or it's not really very practical. I mean, there are, but it wasn't very practical. And uh, but that was a requirement of the state. Well, I discovered that if I change the font size just slightly, that I could fit the whole page with the same page breaks from the 14 inch paper onto 8.5 by 11 paper. So it had exactly the same page breaks and uh, so, so if somebody wanted to refer to a page it would be alright. And I just printed two copies. I printed, I printed the official version to go to the state that was signed and sealed and then I printed a copy for our guys in the contract administration to actually use because they could punch it and put it into a three ring binder. Well, the first time I did this, they showed up on the site and the state guy just went ballistic because he was so outraged. But the contractor leaned over and said, hey, I'll pay you to print me a couple of those. <laughs> so anyway, there are ways to get around it. Let's see. Right. Uh, I, we, we have a couple more comments. One okay, from Wayne yes. Yancey talking about, the, talking about the Canadian National Master Specification that uses a one-third, two-third page format similar to what Dave Lorenzini was showing us. Uh, the comment, though, from Wayne is that it looks to him to be too much white space. Okay. And we have another comment. And gosh, I don't know that I'm going to attempt the first name, but Kirkpatrick is the last name, and maybe I'll hopefully I get to meet you someday and learn how to pronounce that first one. Um, in my firm, we use the architect provide a template form, and vice versa because we want a uniform look for the entire project manual, and that's usually my experience with all of our clients that they want absolutely everything to look identical. And then from David Trudell, we have how many people print out the specs versus only read them off computer laptop. Uh, I'm not printing them. Or, no, he says, and not printing them. Right. I think and that's right. a good question, and I think we're going to see, we're going to see more and more of that, where it's going to be, even in contractors in the field, are going to be using tablets, or they're going to be using their smartphones, rather than looking at a paper copy. And, and that's something that the page format doesn't address yet. Yes, and uh, needs, to, needs to do so. Um, and then Tom uh, Gilmore added uh, a, a point about electronic distribution is that the alternating headers and footers um, don't alternate in hard copies printed from PDF binders. Has anyone tried to see if the headers and footers alternate in hard copies printed from PDF portfolio? I'm not sure if by PDF portfolio he's referring to a special form, but because um, typically when you print a PDF from a Word document, it will have the alternating page and uh, mirror margins and mirror uh, headers and footers if you wanted to. But let's get back to our uh, fonts. Oh. Yep. Oh, but thank you for that intro. The okay. mirror, and if you're using and if you're using a gutter dimension on your page format, yes. In electronic viewing, with the page 
going from one page to the next and having it shift a half an inch. Uh -huh. I find that truly annoying. <laughs> okay. Well, that's that's one of the things that yeah we we need to deal with as we uh, figure out what we're going to do. So probably the mirror margins are, are which is are really look nice in paper and they really work well in paper uh, are probably going to go by the way here in the next few years as people start reading their specs online <coughs> electronically instead. Well, the question uh, under the font size and style, the first the question is, do you want a proportional or a non-proportional font? And here's another federal government uh, spec using the typewriter font, Courier, that um, is a non-proportional font. And what that means is that each letter takes up exactly the same width. You'll notice that. Uh, Skinny letters like L have extra wide serifs to make them wide enough, and wide letters like M get squished, and so that the the vertical members are very close together. Um, and frankly, it just you know we're used to reading, uh, whether it's newspapers, magazines, or text on uh, screen, we're used to proportional fonts, and so. That's probably not more like something like this, where we have both the sans serif fonts for the headers, or I mean for the uh, the title of the spec section, and for the header information, and for the notes to the specifiers, and then serif fonts for the actual text, and giving us kind of a, a balance approach or a variety. Uh, let's, um, Rob, would you please put up uh, question number seven? And that question is, for body text, do you prefer san uh, serif fonts such as Times New Roman or sans serif fonts such as Arial? So what do we like? We like the little feet on the letters or not? I'll call up the next. Well, we have a majority, and it looks like we're going with sans serif. Now, that's interesting. When I got into, uh, many years ago, uh, doing the uh, desktop publishing for the chapter newsletter, uh, I went out and bought a book on such things and read a couple of others from the library, and all of them agree that uh, lengthy text needs to be uh, serif fonts, that they're much easier to read. But um, it's interesting that there is an overwhelming preference for the Arial fonts. And uh, let me go back to um, my example where I use the sans serif font in a rather bold form for the uh, uh, article headings and the parts and the titles and short text, and then use the uh, serif font for uh, the actual body text. Um, but I've had people complain that <clears throat> sometimes Times they think that Times Roman is difficult to to read on a computer screen. So uh, one of my correspondents said that. Anyway, here's some more examples. Of the of that concept, then font size. Let's talk about font size. Um, here's an example. Now I appreciate that I am using. There we go. I uh, have a a widescreen monitor, which I believe is. Uh, somewhat compressed on uh, screens that who uh, have a normal standard size monitor at your office and it may be difficult to to read this uh, but this is a very very small font this is uh, a, um, this one I think is about nine points or maybe less and it's probably a little hard for some of the older guys to read. 
Um, and with respect to, ten, uh, to font size, 10 points, the point measurement for fonts also includes the space above and below the actual letters. So a 10-point Arial is the same size as 11-point New Roman, Times New Roman. Um, but, uh, the contributor who sent this in uh, actually didn't like the, 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 uh, uh, the format, but it was dictated to him to the person by our uh, correspondent by the client. And you can see it's just a little on the small side to read. Interesting. Yeah, and I think it, one of the difficulties with the, with the smaller fonts, Lewis, uh -huh. is that then you start getting a higher density on the page. Uh, you're showing us a page with that has a lot of single line paragraphs, but if you get into multiple lines, the density is going to go up significantly. Well, also you're going to get too many words per line. This one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. So we're in the 15, 16 words per line. And again, if you read books on readability, the ideal is not more than eight to ten words per line. So it just it uh, can cut into the, your readability and comprehension. Okay. Then um, let's uh, clear out some of these examples. And I, David and I were both just overwhelmed with the response we got, and we were thrilled to get so many examples and really enjoy uh, looking at all of them. And I'm sorry we don't have time to look at every single one that uh, the people sent in today, um, because I know that you know it's obvious that you folks care about what your specs look like, and I think that's great. And um, we just, like I say, David and I just really want to thank you for all of your participation and uh, your response to this uh, subject. Uh, this one uh, shows the underlining, which has kind of gone by the way, um, especially now that we can, if you have the uh, opportunity with word processing to put these things in bold rather than underlining. That's kind of a, a little bit more modern. Um, otherwise, it's got good uh, layout, good white spacing. Um, this uh, example shows that uh, some of the words that are defined contract terms are printed all in caps. And again, it's been a while since I've seen that. Um, is it possible, David, that there's a specifier out there that's older than me? Hey, anything is possible. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> we should we should ask. I don't think we want to make that poll question. No, we'll we'll, <laughs> we'll pass that. We'll pass that. But anyway, this is a, a, a fine-looking um, example, and again, by emphasizing the articles, it makes it much easier for the reader or the contractor or the owner or the plans examiner to quickly zip through a section and and retrieve the information that you want very quickly. And that's what we're after. Wow. Yeah. Not so much reading and a I, lot I of text. Yeah? Yeah. I'd venture to say that last example with the underline uh -huh. is you you don't have to go back to it. Is probably the result of WordPerfect because WordPerfect will allow you to underline the, the tab spaces more easily, especially when it's associated with a style than Word does. And that, that ah. was a problem when they were trying to do underlining with Word with the automatic paragraph numbering. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. That, that Oops, that was the same example. Yeah, that's what David is referring to as being able to underline that space between the automatic page paragraph numbering and the uh, and the actual heading itself. Okay. 
Um, we actually have one of our uh, listeners here that uses WordPerfect. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> one of my it, favorites. Are they using DOS? <laughs> WordPerfect 6 or whatever it was that was uh, Jerry Durham's favorite? <laughs> anyway, um, this is... Oh, we're talking about font substitution glitches. What happens when you're using a font that's that's not distributed widely, you know, uh, to other people that have the same fonts that you do? Uh, I like to use this standard fonts that come with Windows, and uh, that's what the the section was supposed to look like, but. Here's how it came out when it was first sent to me. <laughs> and Miss Swift um, said that I kind of like the handwriting. <laughs> it's maybe not the easiest thing to read. And then um, she didn't understand what I meant. And so I sent her a PDF. And she said, oh, yikes, and uh, sent back what the section was actually supposed to look like. <clears throat> so selecting the fonts. Um, is very important in terms of making sure, especially that uh, if you're shipping the files electronically to be printed by somebody else or uh, to be included in somebody else's uh, project manual, uh, that everybody has the same fonts because uh, otherwise you get some intriguing differences. What do you think about the yeah. hint one other thing here? to be aware of? Uh, it's interesting, it's but got a one other like thing it. to be aware of is even in in creating PDFs, Lewis. Uh, sometimes I see folks inserting symbols uh -huh. in the text, and those do not always oh that's uh, right come out in PDF. Yeah, you have to be careful. So you really need to be aware. Okay, well, t next I thought we'd talk a little bit about numbering. And uh, this is an example. Uh, our friends uh, from Canada that uh, prefer to have the what we sometimes down here call the <clears throat> legal numbering system where you use only numbers rather than alphanumeric. And this is from... Uh, Here's um, so that's a typical uh, Canadian version. This one is come on. There we go. This one is the traditional version that uses the leading zeros. Um, that um, sometimes are hard to make them work out on an automatic paragraph numbering. I never did figure it out. <laughs> I don't have that. And here's another, oh yeah, that is, I'm sorry, this is the Canadian example using all numbers uh, to designate the paragraphs. Right, and that's and that's a that's a format that's supported by page format is a CSC uh, standard. And um, of course, this specific example looks like uh, our friend Mr. Laundry, Steve Laundry, is uh, cursing at the uh, the contractor. You know, looks like the kind of stuff the, the that they put in comic strips when they want to indicate cussing. But I like that. I like that. That's good. And then <clears throat> the spec intact from the federal government projects are rather strange in that they only number some paragraphs. So you, we, they number the articles there, and then all these things are unnumbered. And then let's see, let's get over. Here's a uh, the middles again. The article heading is numbered, but not the subparagraphs or the paragraphs, I should say. But we get over here, and we have a 2.1, and then we have a 2.11. Is obviously a daughter paragraph to what we would normally think of as an article. So the specs intact 
uses a completely different numbering system uh, than uh, the rest of us. And if you back up to 1.4 there at the top of the page, Lewis, you can see what yes. they do. The lower levels oh, sometimes yes. end up showing up as numbered. But the actual parent paragraph for the subparagraphs, this this one does not have uh, a number. Let's see. There's a, whoops. Sorry to bounce it around, folks. <clears throat> Yes, here's another one where we have the four numbers here and then uh, paragraphs down here. So actually, there's a sense in which if we were to, the normal thing would be there would be a colon after through penetrations, and then this text would all be in line with that. But for some reason or other, the federal government doesn't like that, so they do it differently. And a joy to work with. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I tell people if every time you get a project with specs intact, you should double the spec budget, which really makes their day. The PMs just love to hear that. Okay. Then um, we get an idea of what we want things to look like, and so how do we communicate that to our contractors, to our uh, consultants? So this is an example from uh, one of our correspondents of a uh, a, uh, a true from Patty template. Gallup. Yeah, Patty Gallup. <clears throat> um, and it has, uh, you know, uh, an outline already set up so that somebody can start filling it in, populating it with information, and a little box here that explains the size of the margins, the font size, and the numbering and uh, and so forth. So, it, a very clear, a, a very good example of clear instructions to a, a consultant to make all their specs look alike. Now, one of the things that I do um, is that well, I keep running into um, large institutions and government agencies that want to write some, but not all, of the Division I specifications. And because, uh, for liability reasons, we can't issue those under our seal and we need to draw a distinction, I don't reformat those spec sections. I just leave them as they are. And uh, usually they don't look as good as my specs, so they make my specs look that much better. Um, have you run into that, David? How do you handle that? Usually we're required to reformat even if the consultants uh, can't get it right, which leads to uh, potential problems because as soon as you start messing with something that's not done in styles, you're opening yourself up for a lot of problems. Uh, you, we have uh, quite a few questions a lot here, Lewis, that, that we could probably finish out. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we're getting we right have, at the end. We have quite well, we only have a couple of examples. Have, yeah, we uh, This example is from Lynn uh, Javorski. Uh, and again, it's, I think, a very excellent um, example of how to communicate exactly what is wanted for uh, to get the page format that they desire. And I thought that was really good. So thanks for sending that in. Um, we had a comment that, um, well, I'm going to pass on that. Okay, and here's um, another example where they send out a blank section, <laughs> which is the title, to the consultant and they can actually start filling it in uh, just like a the outline. And our last example on this subject is uh, uh, yet another example. Um, but again, showing exactly uh, about the vertical spacing and the titles, bold caps, aerial 10 point, very clear instructions to uh, a consultant. And uh, I think this is a, a splendid example. 
Okay, well, we actually got through all the stuff. I was concerned that we wouldn't uh, be able to get through with everything today. Uh, David, do you have any wrap-up I'm applauding comments? you. I don't know how you... <laughs> I'm applauding you. I don't know how you managed to do that. <laughs> so, I mean, we have a couple of... We have a couple of questions yet from okay. some of our listeners, and then I, maybe we maybe we can just spend a couple minutes trying to go through. Yeah, we have a couple minutes. Uh, sure. First, from Joel. Yeah, from Joel Meany, uh, his pet peeve department, consultants, especially MEP who write specs directed at specific at specific subcontractors. How to break yes. of that habit, Joel? I think that's a whole nother session. We could probably spend yeah. a whole, almost a whole hour on that. <laughs> the other thing that gripes me we about a lot of could. MEP specs, uh, MEP consultants, is excessive subordination. Um, I've seen examples where they'll go to uh, levels six, seven, or even eight uh, sub, 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 sub paragraphs. But um, a good point, Joel. It drives us all crazy. Okay, and here's one from Lynn Jabarowski uh, saying that even some normal symbols like quote marks can be translated wrong uh, from font to font. And that's a good point, Lynn, especially if you're getting into the Microsoft so-called smart quotes uh, that they yes. do not always come through correctly. The curly quotes as opposed uh, to the straight Debra's, quotes. Yeah. Uh, Deborah Swift comments that the leading zeros that you were showing earlier that are up on the screen now are it's actually an option in the style numbering format and that's in Word that's true you can yes. get that uh, yes, it is. if you get into and it's customizing also, the uh, style. It's also an option in uh, page format in the actual page format. Okay and here's from uh, Roland Vieira uh, saying the issue on inserting symbols, get the symbol from winged at, um, Wingding font selection and it will always print in PDF. And one other thing, WordPerfect rocks. I still <laughs> use it. Version 15 over Word, hands down. <laughs> Thank you, Roland. <laughs> now if we could convince the rest of the world. Okay. And with that, I'm going to say uh, we look forward to talking to you next month. David? Well, yes, thank you very much, and I'm glad you were all able to join us. And we'll be back here again next month, and I hope to have all of you join us.